Yeah, so I'm here, I, I work for a company called CodeThink based in Manchester, and we work on this project called BaseRock, which we started a couple of years ago. Uh, our work mostly involves embedded devices. How, how, how many people here is that the case for? How many people work building systems for embedded hardware? Well, quite a lot of people. Uh, we found that although there's good tools out there to build systems for, to build uh, operating systems for devices, over, I mean, I've been working there a few years, I've seen some fairly bad practices going on, some horror stories, really. We've seen projects where no one had any idea where all of the source code was, where they were using RPMs, which they'd fetched from Migo, but hadn't mirrored the source RPMs, and then Migo disappeared, and we uh, no longer work with that company, but they, I'm not quite sure how they're going to satisfy their obligations under the GPL to provide source code for everything they're using, because they didn't take a copy of the source RPMs, and it's very difficult to go from an RPM back to the source it was built from. Um, we've seen problems where devices go into production without any real story on how to keep them up to date. Maybe there's a golden master somewhere, but again, no one really knows how to, if, if they have to fix a problem five years from now, no one has any plan on how to do that. Um, so the Base Rock project is an attempt to solve this. If you give a bunch of software engineers the task of solving these problems, they say, well, obviously, the, the solution is to write some more software to fix all of the, the issues that we have. So that's what we've been working on. And I'm going to explain what we've got so far um, and the decisions that we've made. So to achieve our stated goal of making things uh, better, these are the key aims we've got. We want to reduce uncertainty, which there are a few different ways to do that. One of the things we try and do is standardize as much as possible. So we've standardized, for example, on Git for version control. A lot of projects use Git anyway, but we thought anything that isn't using Git, we'll mirror it in Git, and then you have a consistent, all your source code is in one type of, um, you know, one place. I can show you this now. We have um, part of BaseRock as a server called Trove, which essentially does a few things, but its main function is as a source code server. This is the top-level trove for the base rock project. It has all of the source code that we ever need to use, um, which is quite a lot of things. We've got 15 pages of these things, mostly mirrors of other open source projects, some of them things that we've written ourselves for base rock. And you can set up your own trove. You can mirror everything we have here. You can use the trove to import things um, as well. So if, if you want something which isn't here, you can import it into your own trove. <coughs> There's one standard place for all the code. And we've also standardized more or less on Python for writing the tooling, largely because Python is popular, it's standard, it works very well. We've standard more, standardized more or less on YAML for any data structures we need and for configuration. Regarding the, oh, another thing to reduce uncertainty is to standardize the build environment. So. We're not the only people that do this, but the build environment is a base rock system. And so we don't have to worry about running our tooling on random platforms. We run our tooling on base rock, and as long as it works in there, that's fine. You can run base rock in a virtual machine or a cheroot. With regards to traceability and reproducibility, I'll go into a bit more detail about how we actually achieve this. But one of the key things we do is any binary artifact uh, knows where it came from. So I have a base rock root on my laptop. Um, it's a, a Linux system, as I'm sure you'll recognize. One thing that's not there in most systems is this directory, which contains the metadata. Uh, I'll make that a little bigger so everyone can read it. Contains the, what we call the metadata of where everything was built from. So a bunch of different chunks, as we call them. These chunks are components in our terminology. Make up a system. This one is a devel system, so it has Vim, things you want. I have no idea what Warlock is. Um, you'll recognize most of these things, I imagine. And let's, if we look at the metadata for the Vim chunk, it tells you uh, all of the dependencies it was built with. This is a, I won't go into the split rules now, but it tells you which version of the build tool built it. It tells you what SHA-1 in its source repository it was built from. 
uh, where that server was hosted. This is an internal server, but it could easily be git.baserock.org and be public. That's just mirroring git.baserock.org. So you can reconstruct to this artifact if you want. You have, does it have the build instructions as well? No, the source repository has the build instructions in it. So given, given the repository, given the morph tool, which does the building, you can reconstruct this artifact later on, even if it's 15 years down the line. Uh, where's my uh, actual presentation? There it is. So this is fundamental, really, if we're going to satisfy these goals. Um, as is this, I doubt anyone would disagree these days that it's necessary to test what you're doing in an automated way. <laughs> Not that automated testing is a panacea, but it's very important. The other, the finally, the other goal we have is, I notice in a lot of embedded projects, you have instructions on how to compile it, which are maybe on a wiki page, and the instructions are this long. And then there's how to get it on a device, which is another wiki page, which is this long. It involves various commands that I don't really understand. Much better if we can have a standard tool. So we have one tool which is called Morph, and that handles building, and that handles deployment. And the idea is you, whatever steps are needed to deploy in whatever fashion for a device, you package that up as an extension for Morph, and then you can tell people, just run Morph deploy. It's easy. Uh, so it's easy coming up with goals. What the, the meat of the project is, what trade-offs have we made and what opinions have we followed in order to actually come up with our implementation? <coughs> some of these are not at all controversial. Some of, them, some of these maybe they are. We're still exploring the trade-offs. None of these are setting, well, some of them are set in stone, I think. I don't think we're going to abandon Git anytime soon. But right now, this is what we work with. So we think builds, builds are cheap. Source code is valuable. If you have all your Git repositories available and your build instructions, you should be able to reconstruct your images um, in a functionally equivalent way. If you have, all you have is the images, you're not in such a good position. Builds aren't quite as cheap as we say they are, of course. Anyone built WebKit from source ever? It's, uh, it, can take, it can take a few hours. Three and a half. Three and a half, indeed. Um, the main way we get around this is by having continuous integration running. So if you're building master of WebKit, the idea is the CI will already have built it and will have shared that artifact. And so you don't need to build it yourself locally. You can fetch it off the trove. Um, so builds are, if we have caching, we can consider builds are cheap. Um, the choices of Python, YAML, and Git, I don't think are that controversial. Choosing to native compile everything has been interesting. We mostly work on x86 and ARM. You probably know ARM isn't as fast to compile as x86. So WebKit, maybe three and a half hours on x86. On ARM, it can be more than that. Yeah, there's a few ways we've explored to solve this. The one we go with at the moment is, how, is splitting up at the chunk level. So a system contains hundreds of different chunks. We parallelize it at the level of those components. So one, uh, one system builds GCC, and then one system, and then so you're building Xorg. You can build four different components of Xorg at once. If you have ten systems, you can probably build ten bits of Xorg at once. So we parallelize that way. We I recently started using NVIDIA Jetson boards for ARM building, which are very fast. Still not as fast as x86, but fairly fast. And a build of the base rock base system, which is kind of our, our reference system. It doesn't do much other than give you a shell and an init system and a kernel. Um, but the base system builds from scratch on a cluster of four Jetson boards in three hours, 55 minutes. So that's bootstrapping literally from nothing, building the whole tool chain. Um, building a kernel, building systemd, building various GNU tools needed to build other stuff. And like I said, you don't have to do that very often. If you try and build that system again, it'll take three minutes because it fetches everything from the cache. We've explored other options for speeding up compilation. We've tried disk CC and found that actually you get quite limited by I.O. speed. If you're running a build on an ARM board and then um, sending that computation off to an x86 machine to do 
distributed compiling, you then have to wait for the ARM machine to send each object over its probably fairly small I.O. interface to that machine. Um, so we don't use GCC at the moment. We may revisit it later. Um, and it works fairly well for us. The advantages to not native, to native compiling everything are that some projects don't cross-compile. If you've ever tried to build G-object introspection, for example, that simply can't really cross-compile. The Octo project has a very complicated way of doing it, I think, which involves building one of the tools and then running it in QMU. I saw someone asking about that on a mailing list recently, and the response was, oh, it may work. It may, may have bit rotted. If you native compile everything, you don't have to maintain these big patches. A lot of free software projects don't really care if it cross compiles. It works on their desktop machine, and that's fine. You're not going to have them maintaining patches to make things cross compile. It's, it's easier, in a way, to go with the flow, native compile things, and accept that it will be a bit slower. Um, the other choice we've made is not to have packages. It doesn't really make sense for a desktop distribution. It does make sense if you're building an appliance sort of system, either for a, you know, a router or you know, a game console, a set-top box, or for cloud-type systems as well. For example, Trove we build with BaseRock, and it works fine. You don't need to customize it after the fact. Uh, you can build systems with you know, web servers in, it's becoming quite common now to use Docker in this area, and BaseRock's a perfect fit for that because you can build an image, run it in a container, and you know exactly where it came from, and you can reproduce it from source rather than having a golden master, as um, Docker kind of encourages in itself. So we don't really have packages, and we don't really support customizing the system after the fact. You have build time, you have deploy time, and you do any configuration you need at deploy time, and after that, if you wanted to make a change, you, you deploy a new system and you deploy it as an upgrade. So your whole system is then in a new state. And that's, there's a few reasons for doing that. It reduces the combinatorial explosion when you have tens of thousands of different packages and therefore tens of thousands of different states that your system can be in once it's been deployed. Every, every Debian system is a unique snowflake where hopefully every base rock system is the same, more or less. So, the definitions live in one Git repository, and this is where we define the actual systems. Every base rock system lives in this Git repository. Uh, do I have an internet connection? That would be useful. Yes, I do. So this is our Git server, as I mentioned before. Um, this is the definitions repository. Now, we're tidying this up at the moment. I'm going to show you the tidied version, which isn't actually merged, but will be on Monday, I believe. So this is, this is base rock, as it were. This repository contains the instructions for building all of the chunks, um, for building all of the strata, which are basically a group of chunks, and then all of the systems, which are what actually gets deployed on a device. So I'll show you. Um, that's an old one. I'll show you how we build Linux for the one board. So this is the build instructions for Linux. Um, it's a YAML document. It contains the commands you run to configure it. It contains the commands to build it. Uh, this is some extra hack which probably shouldn't be here, <laughs> but is at the moment, which is specific for the one board. And this is how you install it. Yeah, this is preparing the bootloader. And the, the important thing about these, we call them morphologies, which is a name for uh, the, the format in a way. The important thing about them is that they're mostly declarative. A lot of build systems in distributions and in meta distributions are Turing complete. Technically, so are morphologies because ultimately they're running shell commands, but we strongly discourage doing clever things in the shell commands, and the format of it discourages doing clever things where there are, there are some projects where they've defined their own functional programming language to, to do the packages. There are projects where you have Python scripts embedded in shell scripts. There are projects where you have seven different build systems, each one calling into the previous one, and each one taking a file in a new format. And our goal is to move away from all that and make it very simple. 
Ultimately, you're still running shell commands, but any cleverness should be in the, the morph tool or in any extensions and should not be in these morphologies. So this is a, a chunk morphology which builds a piece of software. A chunk lives in a stratum. Uh, this is the base rock geological metaphor of layering things together. So the stratum is defined here. Uh, it has a kind. It lists a build dependency and it contains a few chunks. The BSP contains a bootloader and Linux. And it tells you, build it from this Git repository. This is a keyed URL which expands to git.baserock.org. Uh, build it from this SHA one. And build it using these instructions. Then start to get arranged into the actual systems. So we provide a bunch of reference systems as part of base rock. The base system I mentioned before, you can you know, base projects off this. And the base system contains only a few things. It contains a tool chain, some build tools. It contains foundation, which has things like system D and some other things needed to actually get a, a working system. And it has the BSP, which has the kernel and the bootloader. Some other more complicated systems are Trove, which I showed you before. This uh, this web page we're looking at is served by a Trove system. That contains some other strata to uh, have the Git server, have the web server, um, has its configuration done by Ansible, so that's in there, has some support for OpenStack. You can compose these strata and build whatever system you want. And because everything's in Git, you can do another you can do a couple of other cool things. You can fork base rock and you can come up with your own definitions for other systems, and then you can merge back in changes from git.baserock.org. So you could fork this on GitHub and run a build from there. Uh, well, you'd not run a build from GitHub, but run a build on your system with your code stored in GitHub or on your laptop. You can also branch this. Again, it's a Git repository, so branches are cheap. Say you want to, well, say a few of us are working in this repository Two of us are doing maintenance. One of us thinks that we're going to switch the whole project to using LLVM. I don't particularly want to interfere with the work of the other two for a year while I try and fix everything to compile with LLVM. But I can create a branch. I can work in that branch. I can merge in changes from master. I can merge in changes from any feature branch I, feature branch I want. And I can fix up the build instructions so that everything uses LLVM on my own feature branch. We also provide some tooling in Morph to allow you to edit the chunks. So if you do have to patch um, Linux, say, so it compiles with LLVM, you can have a, a Git branch in that repo too and thread those together. We have a kind of workflow that allows doing that. So those are the definitions. Um, I guess you were looking at the list of systems. <coughs> There's one system for each architecture at the moment. So broadly, we support x86 platforms. We support ARM v7. We uh, specifically have been working on the NVIDIA Jetson recently. That works in a branch right now. Uh, it needs merging to master, but it um, works quite well. Um, we also support power. There's a MIPS port in progress. And more systems would be welcomed. Generally, to, to um, create a new system, all you need to do is, if the architecture's already there, just come up with a new kernel. Usually, ARM v7 works on any ARM 7 system. If you have a new kernel, you can, you can just do a BSP, and that's that. If it's actually a new architecture, is there, is there anyone who likes to create new CPUs with new architectures? I'm not going to go into the bootstrap process now, but BaseRock is actually really easy to bootstrap. All it needs is a, cro a cross GCC, and everything else can be built from there. If everything else is bootstrapped from one, one simple tool chain, um, it builds using BusyBox and a couple of other things. So I talked about the build tool a bit already. We call him Morph. No relation. Um, Morph is written in Python. It's 20,000 lines, which isn't that big. Too many, probably. I'd like it to be less. It's tested with a scenario testing tool called Yarn. Um, the main commands are Morph build, which goes from Git repositories to artifacts in your cache. Now, I'd have liked to show actually building and deploying something, 
Um, network connectivity issues kind of prevent that. I can show you more f about to download some Git repositories and then taking a long time doing it. In the interest of actually showing you what I'm going on about, I shall do that. So here is a checkout of the definitions repository. I'll uh, run more build on the x86-32 base system. And it collects all of the sources involved in building that. Now it's trying to cache a bunch of Git repositories over a slow wireless connection, so it's not going to get very far. But this is the morph build command. Um, this repository I have checked out is the one I was just showing you <coughs> on the web interface. Um, so the base system for x86-32 looks, look like, looks a lot like all the others. And when you run morph build, it kind of comes up with build artifacts, which are identified by a hash. This hash is generated from the metadata, which I showed you before. So each chunk has, uh, well, I showed you that. It stores a bunch of attributes. The key ones are the SHA-1 of the source of the Git repository that it was built from, the version of Morph that it was built with, the versions of, the dep of its build dependencies that it was built with, and I think that's it, the build instructions that it was built with. And so we, we make a dictionary of those, we hash it, and then we identify the build that way. And so if, some, if you upload this to a shared cache server and someone else builds the same thing with the same version of Morph, they can reuse the cached build. If you have a continuous integration system which is doing the builds for you, hopefully you never have to build anything. You can use what the CI has built already. The downside is that certain changes that don't actually require rebuilds trigger rebuilds. For example, if you make a new commit in GCC and you fix a spelling mistake in the readme, it's going to rebuild it anyway. It doesn't know that the readme file doesn't affect the functional output. Um, there are these aren't, uh, the builds aren't bit for bit reproducible. Uh, possible that we'll work on that one day, but so far we haven't actually needed that. Functionally reproducible is enough. We haven't had any situations where we expected a build to do something and it did something else. If you track the source hash and you track how it was built, that's enough. Um, or so it seems so far. <coughs> so morph build gives you a tar file in a directory. What you actually want to do is a running system. So we then have the morph deploy command. That takes the system rootfs, runs configure extensions, which set, you know, they can do arbitrary op operations and be written in arbitrary languages. They can set the host name or delete certain files or add certain files. And then you have a write extension. I'll show you, we have a bunch of... Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, okay, I shall quickly move on to Trove. Uh, well, in fact, I can move straight to questions. That's probably the best thing, if you like. Okay.